Mr. President, the great writer James Baldwin told us, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. The national discussion on race and racism in the wake of the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis has really opened the eyes of many Americans and people around the world. Many people are seeing more clearly, some perhaps for the first time in their lives, the extent to which injustice has embedded itself in parts of America. We see how some of our laws and institutions don't match our stated and professed belief that all men and women are created equal and endowed with the same inalienable rights. Later today, John Lewis will make his last departure from the United States Capitol. He's going home after a long and noble life of service, a life that has helped us to live up to our ideals. How often did we hear John Lewis say, when young people tell me that nothing has changed, I tell them, come walk in my shoes. He was so right. America is different, America is better because of the enormous sacrifice and courage of men like John Lewis, Reverend C.T. Vivian, who passed away as well last week, Joseph Lowry, Mamie Till, Martin Luther King, Coretta Scott King, Rosa Parks, Daisy Bates, Julian Bond, Bayard Rustin, Elijah Cummings, and of course, my friend and the current House Democratic Whip, James Clyburn. So many other leaders of our modern civil rights movement, just too many to name. We are a more perfect union today because so many ordinary men and women and children whose names are mostly forgotten by history risk their lives for dignity and democracy in little towns like Selma, in Birmingham, Alabama, in Chicago's Marquette Park neighborhood. Thank goodness we are better. But the work of true justice and equality is far from over. We know that. A month before he died, John Lewis spoke out about how he was moved to see so many people in different backgrounds marching together for racial justice and healing. Most Americans today are appalled, almost incredulous, that only decades ago, young people like John Lewis and Diane Nash were accosted by angry mobs simply for having the audacity, the audacity to sit at a whites-only lunch counter or to ride on a segregated bus. We reject racism as individuals, but many of us are only beginning to understand the existence and the corrosive consequence of the system of racial injustice. This national reckoning on race in which we are now engaged is helping us to see more clearly how old discredited ideas about race that have been rejected by most still linger in the minds of many individuals, regardless of the laws that have been passed. I believe that most Americans believe very deeply in fairness. It is one of our defining values as a people. I also believe Maya Angelou was right when she said, you do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, you do better. How can we do better to reduce systemic racial injustice and heal the wounds and divisions that false notions of racial superiority have caused in our nation and our fellow citizens? John Lewis told us often, achieving great genuine equality is the work of a lifetime. But let me suggest briefly a few ways that this Senate can begin that work. First, and this is so easy and obvious, let the Senate debate and vote on the Justice in Policing Act. The President can send unidentified federal agencies, agents as to as many cities as he likes, but the calls for justice in our streets will not end until we make a clear stand against policing tactics that killed George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tamir Rice, Laquan McDonald, and too many other men, women, and children of color in America. Our Republican colleagues have acknowledged the need for policing reforms when they brought up the bill that included certain changes. But the bill did not proceed, and it should. This Senate can and must do better. This belief is shared by an overwhelming majority of civil rights organizations in our nation. The Justice and Policing Act, sponsored by Senators Kamala Harris and Cory Booker, has passed the House of Representatives, and I'm proud to be a co-sponsor. 
The House, in passing this version with a bipartisan vote, gave us an opportunity, Senator McConnell, to debate the Justice and Policing Act, which passed the House here in the Senate. We should. Second, let the Senate debate the Economic Justice Act that's been offered by Senator Schumer. Third, Martin Luther King called for racial disparities in health care as one of the most shocking of all racial injustices. That was more than 50 years ago that he said it. And yet, the disparities persist to this day and may be worse in many ways. This pandemic has laid them bare for us to see. Black and brown Americans are three times more likely to become infected with coronavirus than white Americans and twice as likely to die from COVID-19. The Affordable Care Act has done more to reduce racial disparities in health care than almost any act since the creation of Medicaid. It's hard to believe that there are many on the other side still trying to kill the Affordable Care Act in the midst of a pandemic that has already taken the lives of 145,000 Americans. Many more have been sickened, and it's still burning out of control in large parts of our nation. Think about what it would mean if we had no Affordable Care Act and doubled the number of uninsured people in this country. How could that bring us any consolation or confidence that we can continue to make this battle. For the safe of African Americans, Latinx Americans, and all Americans who rely on affordable coverage and patient protections, it's time to put an end to this endless assault on the Affordable Care Act. And I hope that my colleagues, especially my colleagues who speak passionately about protecting mothers and babies, will join me in passing a bill I've introduced to reduce the shocking high rate of maternal and infant mortality among African-American women and their babies. It is inexplicable that in the United States of America, we see so many black women dying in childbirth and so many babies dying as well. It's unnecessary. It's time for us to focus the great resources, health resources of America on this issue. In America, a woman of color is three to four times more likely than a white woman to die as a result of pre pregnancy. Why? The answers are very obvious. We need better, more focused, more understanding medical care. I'm sad to say in Illinois the situation, the numbers are that bad if not even worse. The U.S. is one of only 13 nations in the world in which the infant mortality rate is worse than it was 25 years ago. In the United States of America, we are one of only 13 nations in which the infant death rate is worse today than it was 25 years ago. How in the world can we explain that? I've introduced a bill called the MAMA Act. My companion in this effort is my congresswoman from Chicago, Robin Kelly. Let's get that debated, Senator McConnell. It won't take long. I'll bet it passes easily. We owe it to many across America to show the initiative and to bring it to the floor. Fourth, because our friends across the aisle could not agree among themselves on what would be in the next coronavirus relief bill, critical protections included in the CARE Act have now or will soon expire without replacement. These protections include payments for the jobless. Tens of millions of Americans have lost their jobs in this pandemic. It wasn't because they were lazy. It was bad luck. As well as the federal moratorium on evictions for families, who had difficulty in paying their rent because of economic devastation brought on by COVID-19. Unless we extend this moratorium, as many as 28 million Americans could lose their homes in the next three months. I can't imagine the devastation that would bring to a family, losing your home and perhaps having no place to turn. For the sake of those families and for our ability to fight this virus, we must extend the moratorium on evictions and help families who are struggling to pay rent. Senator Warren introduced a bill I'm going to co-sponsor to extend this critical moratorium through March. It's called the Protecting Renters from Eviction and Fees Act. I'm proud to co-sponsor a bill with Senator Brown that provides $100 billion in emergency rental assistance to help families and individuals pay their rent. Let's keep these families in a safe, quality living environment. The crisis of affordable housing didn't start with this pandemic. The shortage of safe, affordable public housing has been building for decades, and it disproportionately harms African-American families. Senator Harris of California has introduced a bill which I'm proud to co-sponsor called the Housing Infrastructure Act. 
it would invest $100 billion to repair our current stock of public housing and to build new units of safe, affordable public housing. I could just walk you through a map of the state of Illinois and the public housing that I have visited and witnessed that is in desperate need of repair. It's time, you think, to call the landlord and say, what are you going to do about this housing unit that you own that's falling down? Except it turns out we're the landlords. The federal government owns this property. The federal government has the responsibility to fix it. Last week, President Trump moved to repeal an Obama-era rule meant to ban discriminatory housing and zoning laws and policies. It's not surprising from this president, but it's wrong. We need to move forward and not backwards. The housing infrastructure needs to move in the right direction. And finally, once again in the name of John Lewis, I believe that the right to vote was almost sacred in his words, and I share that feeling. But that right is now threatened by a series of misguided decisions in recent years by the Supreme Court and other courts. The House passed a bill last year to restore the Voting Rights Act to its original intent. That bill is being reintroduced in the Senate this week by Senator Leahy and in the House by Congressman Clyburn. The difference? They're naming it in honor of Congressman John Lewis. John Lewis did not risk his life in Selma and so many other places so that people would praise him in speeches or name things after him. He did not risk his life for the right to have a bridge named after him, although it is a fitting tribute. He risked his life over and over again to protect the right of every American to vote. America's faith in our electoral system, a cornerstone of our democracy, continues to be under attack by enti entities that wish us ill. For those who gathered in the rotunda just a few days ago to honor his memory and to stand in silent respect for all the work of his life, I say to my fellow senators who were there, let us pass the Voting Rights Act in the name of Congressman John Lewis. Let us make it clear that his life was worth this and so much more. When you know better, you do better. Our eyes have been opened and now it's time for us to act. Mr. President, it's my honor to serve in the Senate, but I'm sorry to say that when it comes to the production of important, meaningful legislation, this institution has fallen far behind. We seldom take up bills of great importance and magnitude. We just passed the Defense Authorization Bill, a very important piece of legislation, which I believe has passed in 59 straight uh, years uh, in Congress. I'm glad it passed again. But now you see an empty floor and an empty chamber where we are not taking up the issues that we should. There's one person who controls the agenda and the schedule of this chamber, and that is the Republican Majority Leader, Senator Mitch McConnell of Kentucky. Let's not waste this opportunity to make America a better place. Let's do things that make a difference. America is counting on us in the midst of this massive health crisis with COVID-19, perhaps the worst health crisis our nation's faced in over 100 years, with the state of our economy and so many tens of millions of people out of work, shouldn't we be acting together on a bipartisan basis as we did in March of this year to pass legislation? The reports we have is that the other side of the aisle is in disarray. Well, I might remind Senator McConnell that the best legislation that passes here is bipartisan, and this measure, COVID relief moving forward should be bipartisan as well. For it to be bipartisan, we need people of both parties to sit down together and negotiate. That has to continue along with the participation of the White House in order to achieve these goals. First and foremost, we need to restore unemployment assistance to the millions of families that will see it end in just a few days. I cannot imagine having lost your job worried about whether there's another one waiting or whether one will be available, and then have to worry about whether you can make that rent payment, the mortgage payment, the utility bills, food, health insurance, the basics, and to be told that Congress just let unemployment assistance expire, which happens in just three days. What are these families going to do? I sincerely hope that every member of the Senate will reach out to one of these unemployed families and listen quietly to their stories. I've seen them as they come to the food pantries. 
I've seen them come and ask for help, which they never dreamed they'd have to do. It must be heartbreaking to go through that experience. Let's stand by them now. They need us now more than ever. Mr. President, I yield the floor and suggest the absence of the quorum. The clerk will call the roll.